All right. You guys hear me? Yes. Awesome. Okay, let's get started. So, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry about that. I, I, uh, I forked the environment setup slightly and somehow didn't notice it before pushing. Um, so let me show you what you need to do to fix it. So, um, so, so at this point, just to kind of summarize, it's nice we have a smaller group today, so we'll take more questions. Grabbing some water. Um, all right, so the, the the two things I added or tried to uh, unsuccessfully were um, that, that we're going to kind of use today are support for Google authentication and support for uh, connecting to a MongoDB instance during, during development. And those are both things that we use in, in production as well. So um, doing this requires setting up um, basically configuring your environment, and and the way that we do that. In development is we use these .env files. Um, so here's what yours should look like now. And, and the missing piece was this bit right here. I, for reasons that I am confused about myself, have been, been unable to figure out which one of these I'm going to use. Actually, I don't think that's true. I think I'm going to use this one. But for some reason, some of the projects that I've worked on use Google Client ID, and some use Google Client IDs. Um, the project we're working on right now wants Google Client IDs. The parent Gatsby theme project for CS125 wants Google Client ID. So I think the env.development, this is in the example directory, that should already have this content in it. Yeah. So essentially what this is doing, is, is that correct? Yeah. So all you should need to do is edit this top line to look exactly like this, except without that, that final S. And I'll fix this at some point. I just need to like standardize on stuff. At some point I was using Google Client ID and then there's a few places where we actually have tools that accept multiple. Um, so just so you guys understand kind of what the what the role of this is. So you know um, when you're when you're building stuff to use, um, you know, there are there are bits and pieces of the code that you want to live out there's there's bits and pieces of the program that you want to live outside of your code. Um, there's a number of different ways that you can sort of get information from the environment into your program. One is that you can set up um, configuration files. Um, so you could have like a JSON file or a YAML file that someone has to provide, and that can be appropriate in certain contexts. I've started to move towards using environment variables a lot. So an environment variable is a feature of Unix type shells that essentially allows you to create a, a key value mapping that is available to running programs. Um, one of the reasons I like this is that it works out pretty well with how we deploy things. So configuration files sound great, except when you start realizing, well, I might be dockerizing this and deploying an environment where it basically has no file system. So I don't actually want to have to provide a file. Uh, that ends up being kind of a pain. Um, so this way, in development, we use these .env files. We use tools that load these. So for example, Gatsby will automatically load the .env.development file and make these environment variables available to it at one time. Um, I'll show you, we're using a couple of other tools that do this as well. So if we go in, where's the package.json file? Yeah, so for example, when we run the server, uh, we're using this cross env file and then, uh, I don't, Oh, I know what's happening. So we're using this tool called NodeMon. NodeMon is actually calling env command, which takes an argument, which is the file name, the file, the, the path of the file we were just looking at. When we actually build the client library, um, that, so let's see here. Um, trying to figure out where, where rollup gets this information. So, so essentially like these, these uh, files get passed. Um, so actually, yeah, so, so the, sorry. The, the variables in here right now are only actually being used by the server um, and by Gatsby, right? So Gatsby, so the server and Gatsby both use these variables to configure the Google Client authentication. Um, Gatsby uses this to configure our context provider to point at the right server. Remember we said that our, our chat context provider needed a server prop. Um, if you look over here, you can see that uh, what I'm doing is I'm basically checking to make sure that this is a valid and uh, valid string using run types. 
uh, I'm logging it so we can see where it goes, and then I'm passing it as a prop to that Twitter provider, context provider that we've been working on. So this is how we configure the location of the server that we're going to use. Um, this is one of those things that when we do this now, we'll use a particular URL, and then we, when we deploy it into production as a demo, we'll use a different URL. And when we deploy it into production for real, for CS125, we will use a, an even a, a third URL. Uh, so this is a piece of the program that changes, which is one of the reasons why it's been factored into this environment there. The last one again here is, is this is the MongoDB uh, string. So this right now is configured to point at our local MongoDB backend, which we'll talk about in a minute that we're bringing up using Docker. When we deploy this for real, we'll configure this to, to point at something else. And actually, this is a configuration variable that frequently does not end up in any of our configuration files because it contains secrets. So when we deploy this for real, we'll configure it with a MongoDB environment variable that will have a password embedded in it. Um, but that variable is never included in a file. It's actually never passes a configuration variable through a file. It's actually, uh, we use a, a feature of Kubernetes called Kubernetes secrets to, to keep that information uh, safe. It is, it is eventually passed as an environment variable to, pull, to the program because it needs it to connect. But uh, this allows us to kind of put it into place where it's safe. Um, all right, so, so again, I mean, you know, uh, you guys should feel free to ask questions as we go along. You know, I'm trying to kind of explain different bits and pieces of things as we go. Um, so now as, as we're developing, um, so we, we have, because we're going to start adding persistence, we actually need a database. And so we set up a, a MongoDB database. And the way that we did that, we talked about a little bit last time, was we were using Docker. Um, this is our Docker Compose file that tells the Docker Compose program, what we want to do. Um, this services stanza can get as complicated as we want. Right now, all we're doing is we're bringing up a single, Mongo, a, a single MongoDB instance um, that's configured to listen on port. Mongo, by default, listens on port 27017. But this right here is a mapping between our, your computer and the container. So this is essentially saying, make the containers port 27017 available on your computer at port 27017. Now this is fine. The only thing to keep in mind is if you start working on multiple projects and you try to have two, if you try to do this twice in two different directories, it's gonna fail because your computer, you can run as many containers as you want on your computer and each one of them can have its own port 27017, but your local computer only has one port 27017. If you try to set up multiple mappings from it to different containers, that'll cause a failure. Um, and then we're configuring a, a persistent volume for this um, for this uh, this MongoDB container, which means that even if we stop it and bring it up again next time, the data will still be there. Um, so this is nice. Um, so now when you develop, um, I've actually got two windows open. I've got one window over here, and I'll kind of show you how I brought out that up. So I, I ran this npm npm run backend command. And all that's doing, if you look at our package.json file that has all the, the command aliases, is it just calling uh, backend up. Backend up uses Docker Compose to uh, configure. Docker Compose takes, can, can read variables from an environment file, which is pretty handy. Um, and then we basically call up. And that's what brings up the containers. Uh, when we're done, and this will happen automatically, when we control C it, we, calls doc, we, we call Docker Compose down. I have found one of the reasons that this is set up this is this way is at least on Mac I have found that Docker is not always good about bringing containers down cleanly. So sometimes when you stop work, if you Control C it without using this approach, it will leave a container running. Um, that's not a problem, but the next time you go to try to bring the containers up, you'll get a failure. Um, so those of you that aren't familiar with Docker, you know, on some level, it just works, and it's actually pretty awesome. But there's a few times where, you know, for example, like if I control C this, it looks like everything is done. Um, Docker, uh, when you install it, comes with a command line tool that has a number of really useful features. One is that it will tell you about all the containers that are running on your computer. Uh, right now, this is empty because there aren't any. But if there was one kind of lingering around in the background that didn't get shut down properly, this would allow me to find it and, and it just stop it. Um, you'll notice that once I bring up a container, now I have a, has a container ID. It tells me a little bit about the image and things like that, port mappings and things like that. All right. Um, all right. So now we've got our database, and my so my development script over here 
is, is doing the same thing as it did before. It's bringing up three things. It's running the server. It's running my client bundler, which is going to rebuild my client library as I make changes. And then it's also running Gatsby, which is also going to reload the page as it, as it makes changes. Um, I've put code into the server to connect to the database. So let's talk a little bit about the changes that, 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 I, that, I, that I committed. Um, so there are, uh, the, the database is something that only the server is going to connect to. So I just want to make this clear. Um, typically in an environment like this, you don't expose the server to directly to a client. Um, the, um, you could, uh, which would require like providing credentials and things like that to the client and, and it would be terrible. So it's typically not, you know, good practice. Typically the server is the only thing that's able to connect to the database usually because either the server, only the server knows what the password is or only the server can even connect. Sometimes you set up the database so that it's behind a firewall and, and people can't connect it from the outside world. That's actually true for our CS125 MongoDB cluster. It's actually on, a, on machines that are on our private campus network. So there's actually no way to connect to those machines from, from outside campus. Uh, um, Jeff, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So here we're using Docker Compose and I've never really messed with Kubernetes, but how does it compare with like Docker Compose? Uh, so, 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 so Docker Compose is, I mean, I see Docker Compose as good, great question. I see Docker Compose as a development tool. Um, I have used it in certain cases in production. Like that's how we run the, the quote unquote production backend for our, um, what's the, our Jitsi cluster that we use for, uh, for screen sharing. Um, and for the CS125 help site, but that makes me a little bit queasy. Um, Docker, so, so, you know, Docker Compose, it's like a single YAML file and you bring up one thing and it runs a few containers and then you have control C and it stops. So, so for, to, to me, the primary place I use Docker Compose is for development. It's a great way to bring up development environments. Here's the containers to run, here's the ports to run them on, just, just go. I mean, you could bring up each container by hand, and configure it using the Docker command line, which is long and hairy and gross, but Docker Compose is like a nice way of doing that. Kubernetes is really solving a, a much, much, much different problem, right? Kubernetes is designed to help you orchestrate containers running across 10 to 100 to 1,000 different machines. Um, Kubernetes has, on some level, they have some superficial similarities, like they both use YAML configuration files, but Kubernetes is a, a much, much more complex beast. Um, you know, the, probably the biggest thing I would say is the difference is that, you know, Docker Compose brings up containers on your computer. With Kubernetes tools, you're typically, uh, Kubernetes is an orchestration framework. So Kubernetes is basically a way to allow you to distribute containers across multiple machines. Um, so, you know, for my computer, I can run some Kubernetes commands that will automatically you know, start up, you know, eight instances of our playground backend and distribute them across 24 different machines that I, that I have access to that are part of our CS125 cloud. And I don't really have to think very much about how that works. Um, so Kubernetes is, is really a much, much more powerful ecosystem. Um, that said, like I use Docker Compose more on a daily basis because I'm using it to bring out development environments. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, you know, could, could, could you do the same thing with Kubernetes? You could, right? You could use Kubernetes to run your development environments. That seems me, that strikes me as a pretty, pretty massive overkill. Um, so, you know, again, Docker Compose is a great way to bring up a few containers on the machine that you're running the command on. Um, you, can, can you do some of these other things with Docker Compose? You can, but I just like, get the sense that anybody does, right? I don't think anybody's doing complex multi-container orchestration using Docker Compose across multiple machines. There is something called Docker Swarm that's a little different, right? And then Docker Swarm starts to feel a little bit more like Kubernetes, although it's much, there's a huge feature gap there. Um, you know, Docker Swarm allows you to set up like, a lot, Docker Swarm starts to allow you to run containers across multiple machines and really start to think about those machines as a single uh, resource. Um, but yeah, but I mean, but I, you know, like I said, Docker uh, Compose really strikes me as something that was created to, to to enable development, and, and it does, right? So that's that's good. Good question. 
Okay, so let's look at um, the database configuration that's required on our on our on our backend server. So we've got um, there's actually two new pieces of configuration that I added here. One is to bring up the uh, the Google uh, client, um, the the thing that's going to do token validation for us. Again, you know, stuff like this is just like, do I? I'm not. I mean, I understand what this is doing. I mean, this is basically just taking an array and splitting it into a into a a, a, a string. It's basically taking a string that assumes it's a comma separated and splitting it into an array. But some of this Google client stuff is just sort of like magic bits of stuff that I basically found on their website somewhere and now have just been cutting and pasting into different projects. And I have some idea what it does, but it, it works and that's kind of the point. Uh, we'll come back to what this is actually doing for us. But these are the kind of the, the top, you know, the, the, the stuff I put up here in my servers are typically things that are kind of stuff that's done when you start up. And it, and it initializes resources that you're going to need throughout the life of the server. So this server is going to validate lots and lots of different, different Google client IDs. I can create this one Google client authenticator here, and then I just get to use it over and over again. Um, same thing with my database configuration. So this basically pulls, and you'll see, we're, you'll see where we're using those environment variables we set up. So in Node, process.env.mongodb gives me access to the value of that environment variable. Um, so this is now parsing that um, and setting up our, our database connection. Um, the, this, I, you know, I've, I've tried to put a comment explaining what's going on here. Um, you know, there's, there's essentially two ways of doing this. One is that you can do it later uh, in your program inside some sort of promise wrapper um, the other way is to do it like this, and then you'll see kind of what the, what the effects of this are. It's, it's, it's not too bad. Um, so this is setting up a, a connection to a collection that I can either name by configuring it using this environment variable, or if I didn't do that, I'm just going to use chitter. It's my default collection. Um, sometimes, particularly for testing, it's helpful to be able to use a different collection. So for example, if I was going to write some tests against this backend, I might want to use a different collection name like testing or whatever so that I could uh, drop that collection when it was done, right, without uh, worrying about in impacting uh, any of my develop other development environment bits. All right, so now, um, so now what we've done here is we're basically, we've, we've changed the logic here to require that we have an email address. Um, so this piece of code is going to try to verify the ID token under a try catch statement. This is just an empty catch block. This isn't a terrible way to do things in JavaScript. I mean, you could put code in here inside the catch block to log what was happening, but it's sort of unnecessary. This is, you know, for those of you that have done some Kotlin programming, this is kind of the sadness that you end up with because you don't have try expressions in JavaScript. I, I bet they're going to add them to the language soon, at which point I will be extremely happy. But this would be just so much more elegant to do in Kotlin because you could just have the, the email be assigned as a constant as the result of the try catch statement. But in JavaScript, we don't have that. So essentially, I have to set this up as a mutable variable, assign it inside the try statement. If I end up in the catch, um, this is not going to be uh, set, and this is going to, to die. This is some COA code that is essentially rejecting the connection if the email address is invalid. And then I've logged it here just so I, I make sure that, that, some, that this, is, this is correct. Um, what we really are going to do, obviously, with this is we're going to use it, right? We're going to attach it to messages that are sent by this client so that we know who sent it. Okay, that's pretty much it. The, the last change here has to do with how, the, how this gets initialized. Um, and so what I've changed down here is, um, and, and for those of you that are, are new to JavaScript, so um, JavaScript has, and, and I, I don't want to go off on too long of a tangent here, but JavaScript has a, a very interesting approach to um, asynchronous programming that was was really um, it was really kind of emerged from the the features of of the develop the, the environment in which JavaScript grew up, which was the browser. So the you know as as you guys are interacting with the web browser, right? Uh, no matter whether it's our on our form or anything, any sort of web browser, there is essentially one thread of execution that is responsible for rendering this entire page. So it has to do everything. It has to respond to button clicks. It has to re-render the UI when certain things happen. It has to like everything. So it's imperative that no part of the page ever 
blah, or do something that could take a long time, because that will essentially cause the rest of the page to just stall, right? You may have had this experience before you go to a website and it hangs on you, right? Um, that can happen quite easily on, on, on websites because again, there's one, you can think of it, there's just one thread of execution. Um, there's no parallelism in, it. now there's parallelism in terms of within the web browser itself, but in terms of the uh, execution environment for the page, there's only one thread. And so if your JavaScript code gets stuck doing something that takes a long time, essentially the whole page freezes and becomes unresponsive. Um, and frequently, you know, the biggest culprit online, I would say for this right now is ads, because every time you go to a website and it loads a bunch of ads, those ads run in the context of the page and those ads are typically full of crap, crappy code. Um, and so, you know, sometimes when you go to websites and they stall, they, they scroll really poorly, it's because there's crappy JavaScript running on them that is um, running and taking too long to do something because it's poorly written. And as a result, the entire page is stalled. As a result, JavaScript was designed to make this very difficult to do. Um, one of the ways in which this is done is that um, it uses this callback model. So we've seen this a lot, and this is something that you start to get familiar with and more comfortable with as you, as you write more JavaScript, right? So how do I tell uh, you know, the WebSocket what to do when there's a closed message, I, I give it a callback, right? Um, in earlier versions of JavaScript, like when I started writing JavaScript, right? Um, you know, I was coming from a background in imperative programming, writing C and C-like languages and stuff like that and Python. And I just, I, I didn't understand what I was doing, right? I was, I was trying to get something quick to work because I thought it would be fun and I just didn't really understand the language. And so, you know, I would do stuff like, let's see here, where's, where's a good example? Um, let's see, I've got my, um, I've got my, well, I, I would do things like, you know, uh, it, it's almost hard to write this code now because I've sort of gotten used to the new way of doing things. Um, you know, so, so let's call some function called whatever. Actually, you know what? Let, let's do this for real. So um, let's let's use our, our collection here. So let's do the following. Let's say uh, let's say we want to figure out how many documents are in this collection and print it off to the screen. Okay. So I've got a I've got this collection in terms it, it's stored right now in this variable C, and I'm gonna I'm gonna try to explain some of the the, the syntax here in a minute. But for now, let's just say um, let's send. We'll do console.log and c.countDocuments. And, and this is a nice function that's provided for me by, um, by MongoDB. So MongoDB organizes documents into collections. This will give me a count of the number of documents in my collection. Okay, so that kind of, seems like maybe kind of a useful thing to print off when the program starts. So let's try restarting it. Okay, and so here's, here's what I see here, right? I see this really weird output, right? It says promise, and then it says pending, okay? Now, and again, me being kind of a dumb C programmer, I, 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 I didn't know anything about this, and so I would do things like, you know, if c.countDocuments is equal to zero, you know, whatever. And, and one of the cool things about a TypeScript is it's helping me here, because it knows that I'm doing something dumb, but, you know, this, I wasn't writing TypeScript. This was, you know, a decade ago. So I was writing JavaScript and, and just like stuff didn't work the way I thought it should work, right? Like it was, it was super, super confusing. And so part of this has to do with Java's, um, JavaScript's is, uh, model of asynchronous programming, right? Which I'm not sure I'm gonna do a fantastic job of explaining, but it's something that you will get more comfortable with as you go. But one of the important things to understand is that there are certain times when an operation that you want to perform in JavaScript cannot be compete cannot be completed immediately. It would take too long. Okay, so keep in mind, I've JavaScript was written to be run in the browser, and so I can't stop for a long period of time. So, so imagine this count documents function is going to take like some amount of time. So it's got to go through the entire collection, count all the documents. It probably doesn't take that long, but let's just imagine it's going to take long enough that it's a problem. Okay. So what I can do is I can do this. I can say um, is equal to count documents, okay? And in a normal, like in Python or Java or the languages you guys are used to, what happens here is that the program stops, okay? 
So essentially, account document starts to run. And until it's done, the program does not continue. But in JavaScript, that's not what happens, okay? So in JavaScript, what happens is this count documents function starts running. But because the goal is to like keep moving, right? Don't stop, keep going, keep going. Um, I actually can't stop execution to, to wait for this to, have, to, to finish. So instead, what do I do? Okay, well, in, in old versions of JavaScript, what you would do is you would do this, okay? Um, you would call count documents, and then you would pass a callback to count documents. Um, and this callback would be run when count documents was ready, right? So let's imagine that the callback gets passed. This is not how this works because we're using a slightly different model of asynchrony that I'll talk about in a second. But imagine that, you know, uh, this is how things work, right? So basically, you say, I want to count the documents, and when you're finished, run this function. This was called a callback model of programming. Then inside this, I could do, you know, I could do other things that would themselves produce results. Those results would also be in callbacks. And so if you wanted to do like four or five things that each would potentially cause your program to stop, you ended up having to chain callbacks to callbacks to callbacks. Um, there was actually a name for this in, in early JavaScript. It was called the Pyramid of Doom. Because as you see, as we add more and more callbacks to this chain, our code is actually running off to the right margin. Right? Um, and so, but, but again, if, if you were used to programming with, with synchronous calls like this, this, this model was extremely weird. Right? I mean, I remember now having a, a bug in one of my early JavaScript programs that I know now is just a result of the fact that I didn't understand this model. Okay? So for a while in early versions of JavaScript, if you wanted, basically the only way to use a function that didn't, wasn't able to return a result immediately was to pass a callback, which would then be called when it was finished. Now, what we have in newer versions of JavaScript is we have something called promises. Okay? And that's what we're seeing when we call console.log, c.countDocument. The what's returned by that function is something called a promise. A promise is um, Kotlin has this notion of a deferred value. I think Rust has this notion as well. Um, it's essentially, a promise is not a value yet, but it will become one at some point. So essentially, what count documents is giving me. It's almost like an IOU. Count documents hands back a value that at some point will turn into the count of the documents in the collection. Okay. Um, and I have a couple of choices about what I do with that. Okay. So one way, one thing I can do here, we'll, we'll do this. We'll do count documents. Okay. I, one thing I can do is I can, uh, I can do this. So this, and it's gonna, yeah, okay. So let's see what happens when we, when we restart this now. Um, so now you'll see that I did print the count of the documents in the database, but look what happened. It was printed after I printed connected, okay? So what happened here is I got here, I got this promise back. Count documents returns a promise. Uh, every promise in JavaScript has a then method, which registers a callback that gets called when the promise resolves, is what it's called, right? So at some point after it's created, a promise will resolve to a value. The value is the count of documents. Promises can also fail. I'm not going to talk about that as much, but there's also a way for a promise to reject, which essentially means something went wrong, and you can handle that using this catch block, okay? So I can also add a catch to my promise chain. So this was kind of like the first improvement to the pyramid of doom. Because if I wanted to do multiple things um, in a promise chain, I can actually chain promises together. So if this returns a promise and what I do in here returns a promise, then I can wait for it to finish and I can do more stuff here, et cetera, et cetera. So, so this, got, this made things better, okay? However, what really improved the situation is something called await async syntax, okay? Now, you might have noticed that this method that we're, so first of all, notice that we're actually registering a 
promise handler right now. We're inside a promise handler. This value is a promise. So when I called, uh, basically this up here is returning a promise. So the code here is going to resolve once I'm able to connect to this collection, which is what I want. That's why I have this connected um, uh, log message here because the fact that this promise is resolved indicates that my server was able to connect to the database and able to connect to the collection. And so I'm good to go. My database connection is now properly set up. Um, now, when you're so, so there's a little there's a, there's a little bit of unfortunateness uh, here, which is that um, the at at the top level of a job of Java of a JavaScript program, I can only use promises and this then syntax. However, inside a function that's marked async, I can use this await syntax. So now let's look at how to do this using await. Okay. So await requires two things. First of all, uh, well, I shouldn't say that. Await requires that the function that it's called in be marked as async, okay? If I mark the, I'm marking my function literal here, my callback is async. That means inside this async function, I can use await. What it's await async does- Async like uh, suspend from Kotlin? Yeah, there's a lot of similarities here. Yeah, async is, is very similar to suspend, right? Um, and so once I'm inside an async function, I can use a wait. What a wait will do is a wait will essentially cause my code to behave as if it was synchronous code. So now I can write code that behaves more like Python, more like Java, more like C or C++, right? So uh, this, so now what you'll see, and let's do this. Um, so now when this runs, you'll see that I see zero first, and it's a value, and then I see connect. Now internally, there's no difference to what's actually happening. It's just much, much cleaner and nicer to write as a programmer. So again, you know, you guys are, if you're just learning JavaScript now, you're, you're learning JavaScript at a good time. The syntax is much better, right? So await is really the right way to use uh, things that return promises. Now, when you're using TypeScript, TypeScript will try to help you deal with these types of situations. So for example, if I did this, now the problem is I can still log count because count is printable, like we saw before, we see this promise pending thing, right? But if I wanted to, if I do something like this, now TypeScript is going to say promise, so, so this is a, a strange error message, but basically it's reminding me that what I have here in my count variable is not a number, it's a promise to return a number. And so I can either uh, you know, use a wait, which causes it to resolve to a number immediately. I can use, um, well again, I, I can await a promise wherever I want to. So I can actually do this. Um, so now that will cause it to turn into a value, right? Um, basically await, when you put a wait in front of a promise, what you get back is whatever the promise is going to resolve to. Now, again, like I said before, promises can fail. Um, if a promise fails um, and I've awaited it, what happens is an error message gets thrown. And so the other nice thing about a wait is it allows me to use pretty standard try catch syntax. Um, so, which, so if I'm worried that await that count documents is going to fail, count documents is not going to fail, but if I was worried that it was, I can put it inside a try catch block and I can do some things in the catch statement. Um, when you use this then syntax, um, it, it's more complicated. The, the errors caused by promises would not necessarily, would, would sometimes, I shouldn't say sometimes, they would always end up outside of a try catch statement. So if I do this, um, and count documents fails, that error is not going to end up in my try catch statement. It's actually going to end up in the catch block in my promise chain, right? Um, which is not usually, where, not where I want it now, right? Where I want it now is I want it, you know, I want to be able to handle it using a try catch, right? So again, this await a syntax, um, await async syntax for JavaScript has been a, a huge step forward for the language, I think, right? It just allows you to write code that's that's much cleaner. Here's another example, right? So now I'm creating some indices on my database collection. Um, this is something that I can wait on. Now, 
one of the things that's interesting about this whole model though, right, is so, so, so here what I'm doing and, and, you know, we'll, we'll have to adjust this as we go is I'm, I'm, you know, a, a database uh, system like MongoDB allows you to set up an index. An index, as its name implies, makes lookup faster. So an index, this index is going to allow me to ex quickly look up queries that contain both a room and a timestamp. And the reason I'm adding this is because I'm anticipating the fact that as we start to add support for persistent messages, clients are going to want to be able to request messages that were sent to a particular room around a particular time. Okay. Now, one thing to note is that this is different than, so, so adding a query that has these two keys is different than a query that only has one key. Okay. This makes queries for room fast, but it doesn't help with timestamp. I can also add a timestamp uh, uh, index. This makes queries with timestamp fast, but doesn't help with room. I can also add both. Mongo, if, if, if you know, when, when databases, um, database systems like Mongo are smart enough that if I do a query that has both a room and a timestamp, and I have a, an, in, an index for room and an index for timestamp, Mongo will use those indices to make the query faster. It's not going to ignore them. Um, but usually the best thing to do is to set up indices that, that um, describe the queries that you're going to create, okay? Now, we're going to do this every time we start up the database. Once we create an index, when we insert documents into the database, Mongo will automatically update the index for us. So this is not something that we're, we're basically just telling Mongo, I want you to maintain an index for these particular fields. However, this, in, like, let's say I have a million documents in my database and I create this index, that might take a few minutes, right? Now, if I remember correctly, you can actually use Mongo while it's creating an index, that's safe. So it's not clear whether or not we have to await this operation or not, right? We can, um, all that's gonna mean is that it might slow down our server actually starting up, because keep in mind, we're actually not gonna continue down to the part that starts up our, our web server until this operation completes. So this is a place where if you wanted to, you could remove the await, okay? So what's that gonna mean? It basically means that this method will run, but before it finishes, I, I'm gonna go ahead and set up the server and everything's gonna start running, right? At which point this operation will still be running in the background, right? So that's actually one of the things that's cool about this asynchronous programming model. It, it gives you a little bit of control over when you decide things need to get done. So similarly, let's go back and, and look at the count, right? So let's say I have some long operation that I wanted to perform, right? Sorry, I still want that um, this is useful. Um, here's what I could do. I could basically say, um, and, and you can do this with file I.O. Let's say, you know, we, we've talked a little bit in the Kotlin course about how to parallelize network requests. You can do the same thing in JavaScript. I can set up a bunch of promises which start the operation and then later, right? So essentially, this is going to start counting the documents. And then maybe I have some other work that I'm going to do in the meantime and stuff like that. And now down here, I can await the count, right? Um, which means that um, any other work that I was able to do in the meantime can still be done, right? It's, it's, still, it's still going to be able to proceed. Um, so again, if I restart this, you'll see connected prints. I eventually print the count, but I don't print it until I've also completed indexing the entire collection. Um, so again, this is the, you know, just sort of a, a, a brief high level overview into this particular programming model, because now we're starting to see it a little bit more, particularly as we, as we work with the database. And we have a few places here where we have choices to make about whether or not we actually want to stall to wait for an operation to complete. All right, questions uh, before we go on. I guess you feel free to tell me to like speed up. I, I have very little uh, natural sense of how to pace this sort of material. So if you guys are super bored and this all makes sense okay. to you, just, you know, um, tell me to go on. Yeah, well. This might be kind of side and may not really matter much in this context, but how does MongoDB differ from like, you know, other databases? Because like, yeah. Yeah. when I work with like other databases, I've never really messed with Mongo, but pretty much every JavaScript project I see out there seems to be using Mongo a lot. So, so MongoDB really is not accurately described as a relational database. Um, 
it is better described as a document store. Um, Mongo allows you to store documents in a collection. Those documents are, you can think of those documents as JSON, um, as JSON uh, objects, right? Or, you know, any, anything that can be represented as JSON, um, you can store in a MongoDB collection. The, 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 the benefits, so, you know, the, the, the trade-offs here, you know, yeah, this is, uh, this, this would, you could, you could talk about this for a while, right? Um, the, the trade-offs here compared with relational databases like Postgres or MySQL, um, one of them is that um, MongoDB is much less, more forgiving and less strict about the schema of documents that you have in your database. Um, I don't know how Postgres does this now because Postgres and I think SQL now have support for JSON as well within the, the uh, databases that they set up. Yeah, in, they use JSON. Yeah, but in Mongo, every single document in your collection could have a different schema, meaning they could have a different shape. Um, and so particularly, you know, my experience when you're prototyping stuff and when you are, um, when you're working on things, so for example, if, if you look at the documents that are in some of our CS125 collections, the shape of those documents has changed a little bit over time. Um, so, you know, if you look at the data from one semester, there might be one key and you look at the next semester, that key is gone or it's been renamed or there's some additional data or whatever. Um, and, you know, typical relational databases don't like that. Uh, they really want you to tell them, here's the schema for every single object in this, you know, every single row in this collection has the same scheme. Um, and, it, it, you know, at least, you know, when I was, you know, familiarizing myself with databases and, and figuring out how to use them, I found that to be a real pain uh, because I just don't care, right? I also changed my mind a lot about stuff. I want to rename things and stuff like that. And, and with some of these other tools, that, that becomes a huge pain. Um, there, there's, there's kind of like, I mean, there's definitely a, a little bit of a holy war within the database community about, about document stores. Um, Mongo in particular, I saw recently, has been getting some flack for some of the performance claims and stuff like that they've made. Um, and, you know, at, at, at the end of the day, there, there are places where I think relational databases really shine. Um, I don't find myself wanting to use them very much. Um, the, other, the other thing I would say is that I typically find myself more comfortable just doing persistence within the database and doing any sort of operations that I might need to do within my, my code, right? So, so I guess one way to think about it is I don't want to write SQL. I think SQL is, is as a programming language is a mess. Um, it's a great query language and people get really good at it and it's like a marketable skill. If you get really good at SQL, you can go get a job, right? But it seems to me like a strange form of programming that's not really programming. Um, and so I would rather just grab the data out of my database and then do any sort of operations that I need to do within my, within my code um, that I find easier to test and things like that. So, but again, this is just, you know, personal preference. Um, the, for, for what we're doing, I, th I think what we're going to see is that this is a, a really great model, um, you know, and, and it certainly, it's not going to have any limitations from our perspective. Um, so, so anyway, I mean, I, I, you know, they're, they're, they're two, they're, they're Mongo versus these relational databases. And Mongo is not the only document store at this point. There's, there's others. Um, it's one of the more well-known. and it's, it's fairly straightforward to set up. So, um, but yeah, no, it's, a, it's a great question. Our whole CS125 data stack at this point is all built on Mongo as well. So I just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm predisposed to continue using it unless I found a case where we were, it was really hurting something. And I just haven't ever found that. All right, so let's let's actually. Yeah, yeah, I've spent a lot of time explaining things today. Let's actually try to get something to work. Um, so let me go back and talk a little bit about what I did on the front end, uh, just so that we can maybe get to the point where we can write at least a few lines of code, and I can send you guys off something to do over the weekend. Um, so on the front end, what I did is, uh, so we're now requiring login, right? So now in order to connect to the back end. Um, I'm requiring that that um, that the user authenticate. Now, this this is a little bit tricky because what do you do 
when the page is in this state, right? So for example, uh, in this state, the user hasn't logged in yet. And so what I needed to do is I needed to make some UI changes here. Um, I also needed to make sure that the component could figure out if the user is signed in. So uh, let me just quickly go through some of the changes I made to the, to the presentational component. Um, this use Google user is a, another, is grabbing another piece of context from another one of our CS125 context providers. This is a context provider that provides uh, login information. Um, so this is what feeds uh, data to these buttons and is sort of controlled by that, right? Um, there's actually quite a, there, there's a few interesting bits of data that you can actually get a hold of once the user is logged in using the Google client side login library. For, for our purposes, the only thing we really care is whether or not they're signed in. Because if they're not signed in, what we're gonna do down here, you'll see is that we're going to, um, what I've done, uh, it, you, you really don't, there's not a great way to do if else statements inside these uh, JSS, JSX blocks. Um, this is not entirely unintentional. If you look at some of the React documentation, they kind of don't want you to do it. So that's why you see in certain places um, in, in my code and other code, you see these, uh, what are these called again? Whatever, um, uh, ternary operators, right? So essentially what I'm gonna do here is that if, if the user is not signed in, I'm gonna render the login button. I'm gonna put that login button inside a container that prevents them from interacting with the rest of the, the room. So you can see that, that I've, I've raised this container above the room so that there's the only thing you can do is, is log in. Um, and I'm, I'm putting a big login button right in the middle to kind of give you a sense of, of what you need to do. Uh, once, so, so now you're gonna see kind of how another piece of context interacts with our component. So now our component is actually subscribed to two different context providers. One is our Chitter context provider that's providing information about uh, the, the providing these chat capabilities and the other one is this Google login context provider. Um, when I log in, once this process completes, that is logged in Boolean uh, switches over to uh, true. And you'll see that I, I, I basically, re, the component re-renders and I remove that is signed in a bit. Let me see if I still have message sending work. Okay, I do, so that's good. So the messages are still being sent. You can see on the server um, that I'm, I, my email address is displayed. Right, because I, I put I put this in here. Um, I don't know what I changed here, but we'll restart this. Um, and you'll see that it also, you know, it'll reconnect across across server restarts. The um, the other thing that that I needed to do in the uh, just looking up at the client is I actually needed. So now the server is is going to reject requests that don't have a Google token. Um, however, there's times like where the Google user logs out where the Google token is actually going to be undefined. Um, and so what I, what I did here is I made some changes to my uh, the, the uh, code that sets up the WebSocket handler. So now you'll see that that code is also going to rerun whenever the Google token changes. So when the Google token goes from being undefined to being a string, or if it changes from one string to another, I'm going to close the previous connection if there was one. If the Google token was undefined, then there wasn't one. Um, but if the Google token is now undefined, then this will also close the connection. Um, and then I'm going to set up a new connection. And now I've changed my connection query to force me to include the Google token. Um, and that means that, you know, this makes sure that it's provided. Um, one consequence of this, which we can verify, is that when, let me open up the server side code again. When we, um, I'm gonna put some logging in here at the bottom to log when the client closes the connection. Um, because what I wanna verify is that when I log out, I should see the connection is closed and it is. Um, so that's good. So basically this, this means that my client side library is doing the right thing um, when the Google token, so basically when you log out, the Google token is, is set to undefined um, and that should you know, uh, kill off the, the connection so that I can't continue to use it. That seems to be working well. Okay, so let's, um, what should we do? So I think there's a couple of things we could do. I think for, for, for now, let's just look at how to use Mongo, because that's kind of fun. 
So that's actually put some stuff in our, in our Mongo database. Let's get to the point where we're actually saving um, the messages that are sent. Now, one thing we also want to do is, is we want to um, add an email address to our chitter message. Um, that is what's going to identify the user. Now, um, if you go and we go back and look at the types that we've created over here, currently the chitter message does not have it has this client ID, but that's actually the browser tab ID, right? Um, it has a unique ID, but it doesn't have uh, an email address in it yet. Uh, so we could add that, but, but, now, but now there's this interesting question, right? Which is that where should this piece of data... So right now the Twitter messages are created on the client and then they're distributed by the server. Once we add an email address, however, it's possible that the server might need to either add this or modify it, right? Um, so one option is I can put this on the client and I can let the client set the email address and have the server validate it to make sure it's correct, right? That's one option. The other option is I can let the client send a message without an email address and I can make sure the server sets it before that email address is distributed to the rest of, uh, uh to the other clients, right? I also might have cases where I want you know, let's say that I want to support an anonymous messaging scenario where the recipients of the message don't know who sent it, right? Like, let's say I want students to be able to be anonymous in a chat room or whatever. In that case, I might want to save the email address in, on the message in the database, but not distribute it to other clients. So all said, I probably, when we set up run type definitions, when we use a record, it means that these fields have to exist. If I add an email address to this record, I won't be able to send the message until I set the email address. The way to work around this is to um, add what's called a partial, a partial record to it, uh, which is what we're going to do. So, and this is something I need to import from run types. So this now says the, it, the, the email, it's, it's okay for this message to include an email address. It's possible that uh, it has an email address, but it's also possible the email is undefined, right? When we create our message uh, in the, actually the right, right now, it's this component that's, that's calling chitter message check. You'll see that when it sets up the message, it's actually not uh, setting the email address, right? Um, that's okay um, because we don't trust the client to set the email address properly, right? Um, we only, so this is another interesting you know, uh, observation, which is that the server is the only one who's validated the token. The client set us a token, but maybe that's a bogus token, right? Maybe it expired, right? Um, so the server is the only place that we actually uh, trust to set the email address on, on the message properly. And so that's what we're gonna have the server do. Uh, so what we're gonna do here is that when the message arrives, right? Um, one thing we'll do is, I wish there was a better way to do assertions, but um, well, let's just, let's for now, let's say if message.email is not equal to, well, if message.email is sent to anything, right? Uh, we're gonna do, um, uh, and put a warning in here just because some, somebody's not obeying the protocol. We're about to overwrite this, right? So we're, we're gonna set, the email address and oh okay so I need to tell TypeScript what type of email this is. This is going to be a string. But at this point, it, it it's not. That's fine. So so now we're going to set the email address to to be a string. Um, I could put in another check to make sure that the the, the string is actually defined down here, but we already have. Um, we already have this, this check here, right? So at this point, we should have a, a good email address. All right. So now, you know, all, all we're doing is before, now now I've, I've uh, kind of fully rewritten the code to, to use the event emitter. Uh, so that's what we're gonna use to just redistribute the message. But before the message is redistributed to the clients, we're gonna add this email field. Um, now there's other ways that we could approach this. Um, run types makes it fairly easy to create a uh, type to, to create kind of uh, types that are extensions. Uh, so I could create a, you know, an outgoing shitter message type that also had an email address, which would allow me to, to do a little bit more type checking, but I think this is okay for now. Um, but
But this is also the place where we're gonna to wanna to save our message. Um, oh, wait, sorry, other thing that we wanna do. Um, the other thing we wanna do is we wanna add a timestamp. Uh, and that's, that's actually super, uh, super important. Um, the timestamp, let's, let's see if this, let's see if we can get this to work. Okay, so the timestamp is another thing that we're gonna set on the server, right? Um, I'm gonna just do this. For now, what we're gonna do, I'm gonna try having this be, so this is another uh, a feature of runtime, so it allows you to, to assert that a particular thing is a, uh, is a particular type of object. I'm gonna try this. I don't actually don't know how well this is gonna work in terms of the, the communication protocol back and forth. We might need to make this a string, but for now, let's just try making it a date. This is also something that we're gonna set here. Right. So if the server is in charge of setting the message, um, email address, and the timestamp before it re-emits the message uh, to the clients. Okay. So now let's go back to our client side. Uh, sorry, let me pull out the client side library. And when we receive a message, where is that? Ah, okay. So this is the. Um, the message receivers down here. Uh, right, okay. Let's log, let's log this message just to see if it looks okay. Uh, once it gets back. So at this point, once the, the, the message gets back to the client, it should have an email address and a timestamp set. And it looks like something is unhappy here. Is, is this Gatsby rebuilding or what's, what's going on? Oh, something is, something is angry. Okay. Oh, hold on. Here we go. This usually means there's an error. No? Interesting. All right. Oh, we broke, we broke something. Um, and I, sus I suspect I know what it is. I suspect it's the uh, it's this timestamp field that we're setting. Um, but let's some the login in here on the server to make sure the message is making it to the server. Uh, oh, okay, now we have a find invalid request ID. Okay. So that looks pretty good, right? Um, and then what happens when, uh, let's see, so I'm going to make sure the message is being distributed to other clients as well. Some of these errors are probably fine. Um, Okay, that looks fine to me. Seem to have. Uh, seem to have broken something, which is, you know, happens. Let's keep keep poking at this and try to figure out what's going on here. Right in this guy. It's still fine. So I walk in. That's the problem. Yes, it's still. Let's see here. Okay. Look back. Okay, hold on. Here, it's still fine.
The ah, uh, I know ah. Uh, okay. Yeah. All right. So and it, yeah, it's it's just pretty much what I what I was worried about. So what what happens here is is when we when the the ser this works fine on the server. Uh, the server sets this to an instance of a date. Where it fails is on the client because when the client goes to try to deserialize this message, what it finds is a string. Um, and I'm pretty sure, I, I feel like there's a way to work around this. So to, to demonstrate this, let's go over here. Ah, yeah, see this is a problem. Um, we, we didn't add our, we didn't add our add message handler over here on, the, on, our, on our client side library. So what, once we do that, what we're gonna see now is that we're gonna see that, um, we're gonna see that, yeah, there we go. And, and the reason for this is timestamp now is a string. And so essentially what we're gonna to have to do is we're gonna to have to just deal with that timestamp um, being a string. I'm pretty sure that I can fix this, um, which, which I will do. Um, I, I'm pretty sure I found a way to fix this. Um, but for now, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna set this to be this ISO string value that we get out of our, our, of our timestamp. Um, which returns a string that I should be able to deserialize pretty much anywhere else. Um, and once this is rebuilt and ready to rock, I should see. Okay, good. Um, okay, so now let's um, let's go ahead and save this guy. Um, the the only so here's the only place where, where this starts to become a problem. This is the, the reason I wanted to use date. When we actually put this into the database, we actually want this to be a JavaScript date. The reason is that Mongo knows how to index those fields properly. If we save this as a string, Mongo's not gonna know it's a date, it's just gonna think it's a string. And so when we try to do things like sort or do queries based on the timestamp, they're not gonna work uh, very well. Um, so instead, what we need to do is we just have to make sure that we, we, uh, we, we save this with a, with a timestamp that actually has a, um, we, we save this in a way so that the timestamp is a date. Um, and maybe what I can do is I can do the following. I can do union uh, string and then we'll do instance of date. Um, okay, that's kind of cool. So let's, so I'm basically using a union type here. And now what I'll do is on the server, I'm actually just gonna set this to be a, to be a date, which should be okay. Um, I don't know why this keeps, oh yeah, that's fine. Um, and then when I reload this, okay, awesome. So that's 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 great. So now let's let's put this in the database. Um, MongoDB allows us to you know save arbitrary um, documents within our database. Um, Mongo uh, associates a a unique ID with each document that we store. If we want to set that, we can. If we don't, we can let uh, Mongo set it for us. In this case, we don't really have, uh, sometimes there's like a canonical way of assigning an ID, you already have a field. Actually, you know what? Sorry, we already do have a field here, right? Because the uh, client should be setting a field on the message for us that should be a unique ID, right? So should, we should be able to use this field as our key, okay? Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, uh, Where's our MongoDB collection? And actually, let's do this too. Let's say. Uh, just gonna... can, it, can the timestamp work as an ID? No. Yeah, Mongo has some rules. It, that, that would be nice. Mongo has some rules about the, the format of IDs. Um, I, I, you could probably convert it to a, to a to a string and maybe use it, but but you know, I mean, you could have a weird case where you actually have two time two two messages with the same timestamp, right? I think the timestamps are down to millisecond granularity, but that's actually kind of a long time in, in computer terms. Um, so I, I would feel more comfortable using the, the the ID itself. So what we're going to do is we're going to do insert one. Um, we're going to, and this is basically going to put a document in, in, into our collection. Um, I'm going to do, so this is the ID field, um, but let's talk about the format of this. So basically 
in, in MongoDB, underscore ID and a document is the document ID. That's just their convention. I'm setting it based on the ID, unique ID that the, uh, that the client set. Now, one consequence of this is that if this document already exists, this is going to fail. And I'm okay with that because if, if some, for some reason, uh, you know, I get the same message twice. I actually don't want to say that data is twice, right? Um, and so I can I could put this. Why don't we put this inside a try catch just just for sanity's sake? Because there's there's that one. Um, it's just we're not doing something else wrong, wrong. Okay. And then what I'm doing here for those of you that aren't you know new to JavaScript, I've created a new object. I'm setting the ID key using the ID field from the message, and then I'm using the spread syntax to basically uh, copy all the rest of the contents of message into this, into this field. Okay. Now, insert one is a method that will return a promise. So this is one of those places where I have two choices. I can wait for it to finish, or I cannot. And to be honest, this is not a place where it's clearly obvious what to do, because um, well, one thing is if I, if I'm not going to do a wait, then I need to add a catch uh, statement here, right? Um, and maybe actually that's what I'm going to do. Here, here, here's what we're going to do. We're actually not going to put this inside a try catch. We're going to use the older promise syntax. Um, no, I need to close this callback off. Okay. And the reason for this is the following. I actually, so, so there are, so you can think about this as being a, as an operation. The client sent me a message, and uh, the next thing I'm going to do after I'm done with this is I'm going to distribute this to the other clients. So for certain applications, you might really want to be sure that the message is, has been saved before you go ahead and send it to the rest of the group. In this case, I don't care. I feel like you know saving message persistence is a feature. It's not absolutely required. Do we want it to work? We do. If we lose a few messages from time to time, it's not the end of the world, right? I also don't expect this to fail. Um, so rather than waiting for it to complete, I'm just going to start that operation, not wait for it to finish, and immediately go ahead and distribute the message. Um, okay, so let's see, so, so let's see if this works. So, you know, whenever you're quote unquote testing something, which is sort of what we're doing, Obviously, the first thing we want to do is just make sure that we didn't break anything that was working before, which it looks like we didn't. Um, let me go get rid of that. I've got a, I've got a stray uh, console.log that, that is hanging out here somewhere. I wish I, could, I wish I could. It must be in here, right? Uh, and I think it's up there. But it's okay. So this is still, you know, so, you know, we're still distributing the message around. That's good. Um, uh, that seems, oh, wow, me, me, me. Uh, I'm getting a lot of messages now. That's interesting. Oh, I know why. Yeah, so I don't know if you guys have seen this before. Um, the, the, one of the things that, that's happening is, is your component is trying to hot reload. And sometimes this can cause problems with WebSocket connections. They get duplicated. Um, so now you'll see that this seems to work, be working again. Okay. So now let's actually, so the question is, are we actually saving stuff in the database or not? How, how do we tell? Um, well, I mean, you could have your server do a count of the number of documents every time. And actually, why don't we do that? Because it's not, you know, it's not that hard to add. Uh, let's go over here to the server and we'll say, um, after the insertion completes, so again, I'm using this older syntax because I'm not concerned about, um, so I'm gonna do log, um, let's see, I'll do console.log, wait collection that count documents. So this will give me Oh, and I need to add, this is, you always need to add async even when it's just a callback, but it, it works even inside a promise chain. Okay. So I'm connected, let's run another test. You'll see that I've got seven messages. Now I've got eight, nine. Um, so this seems to be working. Um, it also persisted, right? Because you'll see that when I booted up, I already had seven messages. 
Now, you know, you can get a certain, you know, way down the field with this sort of thing where you're basically stick stuff into your application. But a lot of times when you use Mongo, what you actually want to do, or any database, is you want to connect to the thing to, so you can see what's going on. Um, this requires that you have the Mongo client. Now, there's a number of different ways to install this. Um, I'm, I'm very partial to this tool ASDF that allows you to install tools with different versions and different directories. So that's how I've installed it. But you know, there, there are other ways to do it, right? Um, once you have that, you can connect. And ni the, nicely, we've actually set up Mongo on localhost at the default port. So I don't actually have to do anything. If I just run Mongo, it'll work. I can also give it um, a Mongo URL. Uh, or I can do this. These are all valid Mongo URLs. Um, and it connects for me. And there's some stupid, uh, I don't want to do it. I could turn this off because we're not interested in free cloud model. Around. This is great. OK. Um, so now let's see what's going on in here. You'll see some of these are set up for me by Mongo, admin, config, and local. But Chitter is not. So I'm going to use the Chitter database. I'm going to examine the connections that are in here. And then, you know, this is another place where, you know, you got to you know, get familiar with some of the syntax here. So you'll see I can actually print. Um, and then there's a way to pretty print. I cannot believe I'm forgetting this. I really must be, I must be aging. Uh, so dot pretty, yeah. So now this is going to print off all the documents in my database. And you'll see I can kind of visually inspect things here to see that things have the shape. Now, one thing I'm a little worried about is this. So this is something we're going to have to fix. Um, the client ID is blank, so that we're not, we're not setting that properly. Um, but the room name's correct. The message type's correct. The contents look correct. The email address and the timestamp and everything all look, all look pretty same, right? Uh, you'll see that Mongo's ID and my ID are the same uh, value. There are these uh, unique IDs, and then the type is also the same. Uh, OK, so let's fix that problem with the client ID, because that's concerning. Uh, the client ID is something that should be in my connection query, and I wasn't using it. And this is another place where we just need to set it ourselves. I think it's actually being I don't understand why this isn't being set on the client, but let's look. I think it's because this send, like you're, you're just having your client IDs blank right there in the send function. Yeah, right? yeah, there you go. This is something that really should be being set by the, this should be being set in here, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think, I'm calling sender and what am I passing down as a send function? I think I am, I think I have a callback here that's supposed to be doing the send, but. Oh, it's something that I it's right, it's the from join. Receipt. Yeah, OK. Yeah. So we'll do message dot uh, client ID is equal to client ID dot current, and then we'll set it off. right? And then we could also check on the server to make sure that these were the same, same thing we did up here. Um, client ID is not equal to client ID. And here we could also, I mean, the other option to in, in here in these failures is actually to refuse to send the message, right? So we could basically say, you know, our, our protocol is set up so that the client cannot send the email address. The client should also not send a client, set a client ID on, on new messages. Um, okay, so everything should restart. Uh, let me try sending a few more messages. Make sure that things are, are working. And now let's do this, and now you'll see that my client ID is set. So that's good. All right, um, I'm gonna just run and grab some more water. I'll be right back.
All right, so I think we're getting close to a good stopping point for today. You guys have any questions before we before we wrap up? Um, I was just going to ask about the error I was getting earlier, because that's still preventing me from like seeing the server as normal. Which? It's, um, it's the error I mentioned in my post. It has to do with NodeMon. Let's see here. Sorry. Um, Oh, I feel like this is a, yeah. No, 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 I don't. Are you trying to run this like in the, oh no, I mean, I, I think you need to install this command. Um, did you, have you run npm i recently? Uh, not recently, no. I can try it again. I don't know why that wouldn't work. Yeah, I feel like, um, I, feel like, I feel like I added that a while ago, but maybe not. Um, so, so if one of the, so, so one of the things that's a little confusing about NPM is that when NPM runs, it sets up, it adjusts the path to include executables that are provided by packages that you've installed. So for example, if I just try to run this command, m command, it's not going to be found, right? Um, but I can run it as part of an NPM and an, an NPM command because it's installed. In this case, it's installed in uh, m command, right? So there's this thing right here, basically. So I can run that, right? Um, what happens is when you when you run an NPM script, it adds basically adds this to your path. So anything that's available that's installed in node modules.bin is now available. If if you want to check for something, you can use this new feature of MVM called MDX, which will basically ins like run the command out of out of that directory for you. Um, so if you if, what happens if you run this, Daniel? Um, Zoom is being difficult. One second. Um, NPX and that command. Um, it seems like doing npm i did something because it didn't fail the next time I ran npm start, but I have a separate issue, which I think is just um, something that didn't get merged correctly. Oh, um, yeah, okay. And oh, yeah, that's possible if, if you're pulling down stuff. This, this is the error you should get if you just run that on its own. Uh, yeah, that's that, the error I got. That's fine. That, 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 that means it's working. Okay, I think I just have something to fix with merging and then I'll be fine. Okay, cool. All right, so so at this point, um, I mean, I you know, again, I'm I'm gonna you know encourage you guys to 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 do continue working on this over the weekend. Uh, I think there's a couple of things that you could try. Um, one would be uh, going and and doing. So if you want to do a little work on the UI, uh, that could be fun. So for example, it would be nice to get um, a user's avatar and name potentially, you know, added to the message, uh, maybe a timestamp. You know, you can feel free to take your inspiration from Slack or, you know, whatever messaging system that you like. Um, the other, so, so that's, that's definitely very doable at this point, uh, that the message has all that information. It's just a question if you format it properly. Um, well, actually, it doesn't have the name yet. So that's actually an interesting uh, observation. You can get the name from the Google. Um, so if we go back and look at our server, this little stanza, this get payload function also has a name uh, field. So Google knows the name for this token. Uh, so you could use that if you want. Um, I'm working right now on a, on a new service that we're going to use to, to, to maintain information about people that are part of 125 that will eventually be used by this. But, but if you just, this is, it, all you need here is the name, right? So you might just, might as well just pull that from, from the Google uh, token. Um, we want to use names specifically, uh, not like net IDs or anything? Uh, well, I mean, you want to use names here, right? You know, like, because you want to, yeah, I mean, I guess that's a great point. I mean, I, I, I would probably use, prefer to use somebody's name uh, rather than a net ID. Uh, it might be interesting to have someone's net ID accompany their messages for easy searching, but I don't know if that would actually help because we already have so much information about the message. 
Yeah, I mean the well, okay, so yeah, so so net IDs also end up becoming something that's specific to U of I, right? Um, which yeah. is which is something that we don't have right now, and and I would probably prefer to avoid having, right? Um, I mean, he, he, here here's actually what you would pro the way that you would probably do this, I right? Mean, does an email have net ID anyway? So you can use that. Basically, but, yeah. But if um, you use email, it like works for other contexts as well. Yeah. Well, so so here's here's what I would suggest, which is that that now you're at a place where you're you're starting to think about the presentational logic, right? Um, I think it would be cool. If, I mean, you know, whatever. This is something that we're building for us to use. So I, I always try to make these trade-offs on a case-by-case -case basis. Sometimes it's good practice to try to avoid tying things to our particular use case. In other cases, it's like, it'd be way too much work. Fuck it, I'm just going to do it, right? Um, here, here's what I think, right? I think that the presentational component is something that we will own. So if you guys want to put stuff in there that's specific to U of I, go for it, right? I don't care, right? I think we can do this in a way that leaves the clients, this client side library completely agnostic, right? Like it, all it does is know, it, all it should know about, well, actually, to be honest, it doesn't know about email addresses at all right now, right? The email address is just a piece of information that's being passed through in the message, okay? So one possible thing to, to work on would be basically trying to make the UI a little nicer. Um, I think another cool, there, there's two other things that would be cool uh, that, that I would encourage you guys to, to try. Um, one is being able to query old messages, right? So that's, a, that's something that you would want as part of the UI, maybe, um, but you also would need to add support for it, right? This would require adding a message um, I, I would suggest, so here's how I would probably, here's the, my mental sketch for, for this particular thing would be, I would add a message that the client can send to request old messages, uh, in a room. And probably that message should have some timestamps, right? Maybe a start and an end time. Maybe the end time is optional and you only use that if you're requesting a range or maybe, or, or maybe you say something like, give me the latest 50 messages or whatever. I mean, there's multiple ways to do this, right? Um, and when the client enters the room, then it can use this to populate the chat so that it's not empty. Um, that, you know, requires that you add some logic to the server for doing those queries. Um, and then figure out also how you want to get messages back to the server. So you could certainly send back just a bunch of chitter messages, um, which would be fine. Uh, and that might be a good way to do it, right? I mean, it's just one message, it's, it's just another message, right? Um, the only thing I find weird about that is that like, those aren't really new messages. And so it's a little like, you might wanna be able to distinguish between a new message that's arriving that was actually just sent and a message that's arriving because you requested old messages, right? So that's a little bit of a, an interesting thing to, to consider. Well, um, like, I know, I know Discord at least has like a lot of bots which just have um, like command functions that start with like messages that start with exclamation points or dashes or something for like bot commands. So we could differentiate messages based on their contents. Um, well, so, I, so I've actually, and actually that's a, that's, a great, that's a great place to go with this, right? I've actually stuck a message type field in here, right? Now I have a, I have a use case for this in mind that we'll get to, but um, but you cannot, but feel free to, 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 to modify this, right? So for example, I could just put a, uh, new, uh, field, right? And I think it's going to be mad because, uh, new is probably a reserved word, but I could do something like this, right? Actually, maybe it's not mad about, maybe, a new oh, I need to import this type. That's the problem. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Um, right. So now. I just have an easy flag that I can use to basically tell the, the to, to tell the front end, hey, this is a message that you that arrived from another client in real time versus this is an older message that you requested, right? Um, so that's one way to do it, right? But but there are others. The other thing that you could do um, that would again require probably some changes to the to the messaging protocol is provide a way for people to edit a message, right? 
Um, that again requires some front end stuff, right? So I have to figure out like what's the right way to support this within the UI. Um, and then I also need to figure out a way to adjust the messaging protocol to allow people to, to edit messages, right? Um, final option, which, which, <laughs> which to be honest, I would be, be something that I'd be really excited to see would be Markdown support, right? You don't have to get fancy about it, um, but just you know, having this be actually rendered as italics, which would be nice. One of the things that's currently broken that I would encourage you guys to fix, it's a pretty easy fix, uh, multi-line is not working, <laughs> right? I mean, that, that shouldn't be rendered that way. Um, and again, that's a very, very easy fix. Right now, but but anyway, so these are ideas to sort of places uh, to where places to take this. Um, the uh, I think one of the things that will I mean we're we're getting close. I would argue to the point where we can actually deploy this um, for fun, just to kind of see how that the, those pieces of it work. And so maybe we'll do that next week once once we. I, I I would say we should probably add a few more features, at least like maybe having an avatar and a name. Uh, you know, so if we go, if we go put a demo of this up on GitHub and people start come, come and start scribbling all over it, I, I'd at least like to know what their, you know, what, what their profile pictures look like or something like that. So, um, so anyway, so that would be, uh, th these are all kind of, kind of, uh, potentially cool features. Um, any questions? Yeah, I think this is in, in, you know coming together. I mean, and again, you guys want to adjust the the, the 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 styling as well. This is not something that we've spent a lot of time thinking about, but it certainly would, could 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 use could use some could use some help um, just in terms of making it a little cuter. Um, and then you know, I I, I mean, one thing I, I think would be uh, would be interesting is keep in mind that we do have this message type flag here, right? And the contents can be interpreted, uh, you know, based on that message type, right? The contents could really be anything. Um, and so one of, one of the, 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 the kind of exciting integrations for this that, that uh, I've talked about with a few people is being able to add chat to our editors and also synchronize the editor contents, which we would essentially do by, uh, by adding, um, by also moving the editor contents around through the same chat uh, room, uh, but with a different message type that would be interpreted by the client differently. So, all right, cool. So, you know, you guys have some things to poke on this weekend. Feel free to post on the forum if you get stuck or have questions. And we'll meet up on Tuesday. We'll talk a little bit about kind of what cool new things you guys added. And then we'll, um, I think we'll, yeah, I think we'll start getting, pull maybe pull some of those into you know, the, the master copy so that we have a, a prettier demo and then actually get this thing uh, deployed and, and uh, start to talk about maybe what's next. So, all right, I will see you guys, uh, talk to you guys on Tuesday. Thanks, cool. Thanks yeah. Jeff. See ya.